So uh, before uh, jumping to uh, the solution, like, like let's look at what's the problem that we are trying to uh, uh, find a solution here. There are two problems actually when it comes to these kind of projects. The first problem is uh, this. So I, I took an example. So we worked uh, on this project, uh, an organization building a platform. So they were planning to uh, create 100 APIs with uh, 60 message flows and around 80 services and a number of databases. So, and they uh, started uh, making the application multi-tenanted, like uh, having three active uh, tenants. And then uh, the first release happened after uh, three years because um, of the number of uh, uh, services, APIs, and rest of, rest of the stuff they had. So once they released the project in uh, after three years, there was no value of the platform uh, because uh, the requirements has changed from the technical side as well as from the business side. So why I put a waterfall behind that? Because their, their approach was kind of a waterfall method. So that's the first problem that we see with many projects. And then project fails, and then it affects the people, and then uh, people get fired, so and uh, like a lot of complexity uh, behind this. Then the second problem is this. The RFPs, like we kind of uh, fill around, uh, so we have around 10 RFPs at a time uh, that we fill in various domains. The problem with the RFP again uh, connected with uh, the, uh, the waterfall method, but then again, uh, it's more than that because you spend a lot of time to create the RFP and then you open the RFP, collect the responses, and then um, uh, like do the selection process. And sometimes selection process include demos, building POCs, and then you start the implementation. And most of the time, implementation is based on the requirements you had in the document plus the implementation uh, plan provided by the, uh, the technology vendor. Again, the same result. Uh, I took this example. The result is like this, a boat in a desert, because what's the, the purpose of this? A person who doesn't have a shelter can use this, but uh, it's not providing the same result. So that's the, um, uh, the result of most of these kind of projects. So uh, the solution, basically, I took an uh, example, real-world example. Uh, anybody knows this? Uh, yeah, Hubble. Yeah, the Hubble um, uh, telescope. So how Hubble worked, actually, it's a very interesting engineering project in our uh, history. So it started in the 70s, but the core architecture that they uh, put in Hubble uh, like uh, enabled them to improve this without an issue. So the, the fundamental um, architecture that they put, they thought a lot and then put an end state architecture, but it got uh, improved um, year by year. And then we have a very um, interesting product today. So that's, uh, that's the approach that those engineering team uh, to, took, and we can apply it in our software as well. So this is basically the uh, core um, idea that I'm going to talk about uh, during next uh, a few minutes. So it's it's totally about a uh, thing big act small. I think you can see the lion and the cat. So that's the whole concept. And uh, I think Sanjeeva briefly mentioned about this thing as well. So the, it's basically uh, come up with a MVP or a minimal viable product, and then show the uh, business the ROI, and then improve on top of that. That's the whole idea. Rather than think about this, um, uh, the end state of the uh, the uh, product or the project. So it's basically about you plan it and you build it, you test run, and then. Uh, you repeat that same um, uh, the process. So the, the idea here is how you utilize the current infrastructure and then the assets that you have to build the uh, MVP rather than you try to get uh, everything that you required. As an example, you might not have a message broke at the first stage of your implementation. Probably you forget about PubSub at that uh, time or eventing at that time and then do uh, request and response. Like that, uh, depend on what you have, you build the MVP and uh, providing some results to the business is the whole idea. So it's two parts actually, technical and non-technical. So non-technical thing is the cultural uh, thing uh, Jonathan and Sanjeev explained. Uh, so I will go through some of uh, the experience that I had in this uh, uh, the uh, 
uh, the journey. So I call it as iterative people, yeah, because it's about people, and everybody in this room, like uh, we know, uh, the people is the most important thing uh, in when it comes to technology, because you can uh, write, write 100 uh, lines of code within uh, one night and then uh, provide a, pro a product, but uh, people is the most important part in uh, these uh, organizations that we work. So why call this as a digital workforce? Because now the mindset, how people operate and how people take decisions is di different from the traditional way we build software. So we need to build this digital workforce uh, to be successful in these projects. So to start it, uh, uh, even if it's a digital workforce, uh, we operate in these projects called uh, in a pod. A pod is a small team, maximum 10 people. Amazon call it as a pod should be able to share a, uh, a pizza basically so that's called a pod but to operate a pod organization should have a proper structure that we call is a podular organization so I took this example from a book uh, written by this guy called Dave Gray a great book uh, called The Connected Company so once uh, I was flying to uh, Barcelona, uh, we had our uh, European conference and then Sanjeev asked me to do this uh, talk about connected company because digital transformation earlier called as a connected um, uh, business. Then I found this book and then it's really interesting. So in that book, Dave explained uh, to operate um, uh, organization as pods, you should have this podular organization. Uh, the organization structure and then organization policies should support uh, to be a podular. Then the, uh, the, the, uh, to start the digital workforce, you should start from somewhere. That's where the uh, iterative people where comes. I call it as a digital core, that you should understand and identify um, a set of people who can quickly change and quickly understand the new technology and business challenges, basically bridge the knowledge and the cultural gap that currently you are having uh, what you are required. So start small and then build this small group called Digital Core. And then Digital Core can uh, start uh, building more and more uh, internal people and then transform them into the digital workforce. So we call them as the followers. So some of the technologies that we use, uh, I mean techniques that we use to uh, bring more and more people, one is evangelizing, like the digital core can evangelize. And then um, uh, you should have a proper onboarding program. If a new set of people coming into the uh, digital workforce, what sort of things that you should do? What are the materials that you have? And then videos or whatever, uh, the information that you can share, it has to be a very structured thing rather than a, a random thing. And then the training, uh, usually um, the concept of a train the trainer type of a thing, identify a set of people who can be trainers and then train them first and let them to uh, train other people. Then the final thing is hackathons because these days people are reluctant to read, I think, like uh, you can write articles, you can have webinars so and so forth, but people um, like to touch the stuff like Rajiv explained. And um, uh, so you you can do a lot of hackathons. So this is a very successful way of uh, 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 evangelizing this stuff, especially how to build a digital product, how to use the APIs, and then how if you are moving into uh, new architecture patterns like microservices, how you can build some set of microservices. So hackathon is a really good way to um, uh, train set of people as well as evangelize the technology. So the uh, to uh, have a digital workforce as well as to bring in this new culture, what you should have is called an open system. So the, uh, uh, the, the open systems are not, uh, I mean, most of the organizations trying to have open systems. So WSO2 is a, a true open system. I'll explain you in detail uh, with a couple of examples how and why we are uh, called we, uh, as an open system. Basically, open systems, as a result, it engage people, it empower people, and it entrust people. So these are the three main things an open system uh, will do. So I'll uh, give you two examples on this one. One first example about um, uh, WSO2. So I joined WSO2 in 2008, June 1st. And then in September uh, 27th or somewhere like that, uh, Sanjeev asked me to uh, go to uh, 
uh, the uh, one of the technology companies who's trying to orient WSO2 uh, software and then trying to build a new product in Long Island, New York. So he asked me to go there and then uh, uh, kind of lead that particular effort. So it's a big deal and I think at that point that was the largest customer we had. So I went to Sanjeeva's room and asked uh, what uh, should I do and what uh, can I uh, can I give some advice and how, what should be our approach. He said, have fun. Okay. So then I thought at that point, it was like a few months I joined WSO2 and then uh, our CTO at that point, uh, Paul Fremantle, he's currently on study leave and uh, doing his PhD. I think he finished his PhD. Now we call him Dr. Paul. So the, uh, then Paul was traveling and I thought Sanjeeva's advice was because of that. Okay. So then I went there and then this, this project came back and then around November time frame, we got another project with the um, uh, US largest retailer to have a five day uh, 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 kind of a technology deep dive. Then I went to Sanjeev again and asked, uh, okay, what should I do? The answer was have fun. Okay, so what's the answer why he gave that? It's about engage and empower and trust. So that gave me like a lot of responsibility now. So I had to build the uh, technology pitch. I had to uh, kind of um, uh, uh, create the correct message and then go and deliver. So that's basically kind of a, a quality of an open system that you empower people. You can just say empower, but uh, you will not act. But that's kind of a really good example on how empower and entrust your employees. The second example of this, um, I went to uh, uh, this uh, uh, one of our customers uh, based in New Jersey. Uh, they had a, a massive integration project. Again, we divided into small iterations. First iteration was um, to build a security gateway. Uh, they had a, a security gateway implemented using um, uh, some Apache uh, uh, scripting. Uh, so they wanted to replace that thing, so that was the first project. Uh, so uh, we had this technical discussion and then identified uh, uh, the enterprise service bus and the combination of identity server can have a proper um, uh, security gateway solution by uh, ESB acting as the gateway and then uh, identity server keeping policies and then acting as a policy endpoint. Then uh, the discussion went well and then they brought their security expert who wrote that previous uh, Apache gateway. Uh, we'll call him as uh, Peter, okay, or something. So then he, he engaged with the, uh, uh, the discussion and then he said this doesn't work, the new design doesn't work. Then we asked a question, then he said no, you guys can't understand the requirements, you guys uh, uh, can't understand the infrastructure that they have. So he was keep on arguing about this thing. So it came to a limit, my security knowledge was not enough to convince him. Then I got uh, the uh, our security expert called Prabhat Sirivadan, he's the director of security architecture, uh, on call and then try to convince uh, uh, this guy about the new implementation, what are the advantages, how it um, meeting the current security um, standards and so forth. But then again, he couldn't convince as well. But for some reason during this discussion, I told that guy, okay, Peter, you are the one who's going to implement the new gateway. Then at that point, everything changed. Then he said, okay, let's look at, and then let's go to the whiteboard, uh, look at the new design, and uh, um, uh, look at how the new implementation looks like. After that, then he was on board, and then um, he started looking at the architecture, and then a very supportive guy. The turning point was like, he was not sure. He had an issue with his job security, because now a new technology coming, his gateway is going out of the picture, so what will happen to him? So basically, the, what I did give him some empower and then uh, give him some trust, okay, you are not out of the picture, you are in the picture and you are the one who is responsible for this. I think when you build this uh, digital workforce, this is a key thing. People feel very insecure about this new technology as well as new approach, so we have to make sure that everybody is comfortable and everybody is part of the new architecture from day one. So that is uh, something that we experience a lot and we help customers to kind of um, uh, communicate the message clearly and uh, get everybody on board uh, to the same page. Then the next thing is be agile. You have to be agile because um, the, the even agile processes are not agile. As an example, uh, every uh, stand-up meeting happens at the same time of the day. Okay. 
that's not agile, uh, even in, inside the agile process. So I'll, I'll give you some of uh, uh, my personal experience because um, even our day-to-day -day stuff are uh, not agile and if you uh, try to be agile on day-to-day -day stuff, it's really helpful because I do, I usually run two miles per day and then uh, I had a pattern of running around 7 p.m. And then there was an issue like if I have a heavy meal or if the weather is bad, then I start skipping this, uh, uh, t my uh, jogging pattern. And then I identified, okay, it's not that uh, uh, the 7 p.m. Uh, when I feel I can run, I should run. Okay, if the weather is good and then if I feel good, then that changed me. And now I run around 9 a.m. If I wake up early 6.30, I run around 6.30. And then if I work from home, then have before lunch, I um, uh, have my jog. So it was kind of really successful because I have been agile on these things. So the, my advice on the, the process and then uh, the building these uh, uh, workforces, you have to be really agile and then adopt to uh, the changes that you are facing on day to day. So that's about uh, the, uh, the, the people there. Uh, and then uh, let's look at the iterative software and what we can do it from the architecture side. So I'm explaining two models. First model is a layered architecture model. So we looked at this uh, layered architecture earlier. In most of the projects, um, you can start like you have the source system of record in most cases. And then you have some way of accessing the data. So we, you can quickly bring the system of engagement and build some products. So that's the first approach. And then you can improve it by bringing the integration layer and make it more um, efficient as well as architecturally correct. And then you can bring automation at some point as well. This is not in order uh, based on your requirements. You can bring each and every layer like this. So if you look at the onion diagram, you will have the data and the services. You bring the... Uh, uh, the integration layer and then quickly build a digital product and then around the integration layer you can bring the, uh, the APIs and then uh, identity and access management and then uh, the analytics and probably IoT at some point like that. Bring each and every layer based on your uh, priority. And Sanjeev said like uh, having a security is a really good thing to bring. Uh, so again, it's a, a, a good advice as well as uh, if you can start from there. Uh, but it might change based on your need as well as where you are in the project. So you can pick the, uh, uh, the way uh, how you iterate based on uh, your requirements. Then the second model and uh, the model that I like is the segmented architecture model. So the segment architecture. So that uh, how it works basically it's more towards use case based that um, you define your iterations based on use cases because earlier approach you are bringing some kind of a technology stack or a technology layer and then keep on adding the technology layers in that approach. So this is a little different. So it's basically you start, you, so you have the system of records, you have the source system of record, and you bring some kind of automation, uh, you bring some uh, system of integration, and then you bring some uh, system of, uh, um, uh, 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 the top one is a system of, uh, I can't remember, uh, sorry, a system of, uh, engagement actually, uh, uh, like that. And then you improve it, so you have the first iteration like this, and then second iteration with uh, the requirements, you bring a um, little bit of uh, functionality like that, you keep on improving your layers. So if you go back to onion diagram, okay, it can looks like you have the first digital product with some integration, with some data, uh, some API security, uh, so and so forth. So second project, it will grow like this, and then it will keep on grow uh, till you come to the end uh, state. So that's the second approach that we are doing. So um, I explain about the runtime view of uh, this architecture. Uh, so if you look at the runtime view, you can again segment each and every um, section of the uh, uh, your end state architecture into uh, different systems. And each and every segment can have its own iteration and improve. And uh, as a whole architecture, it will get improved as well. So this is not like, um, uh, you can define the uh, segments based on uh, how you look at, how your organization structure is there, and then how your business units operates, um, so and so forth. So uh, basically the idea here, segment your uh, in state architecture into different segments and uh, keep on improving within that 
as well as you will add more and more segments into the uh, architecture as well. So the main thing is this, um, the interoperability of this stuff should happen properly because otherwise it doesn't work. So that's where like uh, a platform architect team should uh, get involved because each and every segment might be proje project centric. So the project architects will only look at that particular project. That's where the uh, enterprise architects or the architects or the platform architects should come into the picture and look at uh, the standards as well as the interoperability of different type of segments. Then the uh, digital platform, we talk about building a platform now. Your architecture is iterative, but if your platform approach, uh, if it is not iterative, uh, you have a problem. So to have this, uh, uh, the iterative approach, um, I recommend this model, like uh, without having a platform approach from day one, uh, start with the project. And then once you put the first uh, production deployment of that particular project, then start looking at the platform. So how you do it, basically identify what are the common things that you can bring it to a platform and then push those, fe uh, those features into the platform layer and then keep only project related stuff in the uh, platform uh, on the project layer and then rename name the platform as the uh, version one. Then what will happen, uh, version 1.1, project 2 will come into the picture, and then uh, project 3, project 4, and if you carefully notice, then project 1 uh, going in its own path and improving and iteratively improving functionalities of that. Like that, you can continue. So the, the uh, idea here, uh, basically, uh, first iteration will have its own, uh, its own life cycle that you plan, you build, you release, and uh, the, uh, uh, you ask the people to use it, get feedback, and uh, use the feedback uh, to the planning stage of the second iteration. Like that, you will continue this over and over. So the feedback loop is the most important thing because um, um, you can uh, convert the feedback into requirements and improve your project and provide a more uh, consumer success as well as consumer needs. Then the tools basically, so uh, what are the tools as an architect that you can use? So my favorite thing is Scrum, like basic uh, practices that you get in Scrum, and Scrum got like less documentation, that's something I really like. Uh, so uh, divide your uh, iterations, basically uh, our approach with most of the customers, uh, one month to uh, three months uh, project life cycles. Uh, within a month you put something into production, and uh, the uh, uh, some projects like it's really hard to scope it to uh, one month uh, due to various reasons so we use uh, around three months and internally in product development we follow the same uh, concept as well our releases are like two week uh, sprints that we use and every uh, two weeks we uh, provide something usable and releasable in our uh, product development life cycle but application development is a little different there are a lot of dependencies so we use this one month to three month cycles in this, so this is the first tool. But uh, some of the organizations required um, heavy architecture uh, practices because Scrum is a very uh, lightweight architecture framework. Uh, that's the beauty of it, but um, uh, some organizations need this heavy uh, uh, framework. So this is a good uh, the framework, the safe or the scale agile framework is a really good framework for that kind of an organization um, who needs to like build more um, uh, uh, comprehensive enterprise architecture practice and then convert into an iterative model. So if you are not satisfied with SAFE, then there's another model called this, uh, the Open Group of Architecture Forum. So they have a nice model and then uh, they have a different or a reference model for the, uh, uh, the uh, iterative architecture as well. Uh, it has a proper documentation flow and then project planning flow, um, and so on and so forth, so you can pick it and uh, uh, practice it. So those are kind of uh, documented and standard uh, uh, tools that you can use, but uh, you have to create your own tools. So that's the most important thing. Based on um, your organization, nature of your projects, and then nature of the technology that you are using, you should build your own tool. So I took um, two examples. First example is Motorola is a uh, customer of WSO2. So if you buy uh, a phone, this Moto X phone that they have, very uh, popular one that you can customize the phone, 
from um, uh, each and every component that the color and then you can even engrave your name so back end of that um, uh, the the how it works basically motorola call many uh, suppliers uh, to uh, build the phone so all the orchestration uh, or the integration layer happens through our uh, api and integration layer so what they did actually they uh, to improve this uh, iterative process you need a lot of a lot of automation they create this thing called one touch uh, automation so basically when a, a new innovation team comes and then asks for some space it's basically one touch thing that they configure they tell okay this is the environment that required and then it will spin up a number of uh, docker images with wso2 runtime for that particular team to start development and it's not only development that uh, they ask the question how many environments that you need it can be like a typical QA environment and then staging and production. So all these things created automatically and um, provision it for that particular business unit. So they call it as the one touch automation tool. And then the next uh, example is uh, uh, creating your own tools to be iterative, like how you can uh, be more productive. Uh, the Bank of New York Mellon, so they have this uh, financial platform called Nexon. Uh, so they are using our API manage and um, integration product. Products. So they create a nice tool actually uh, to uh, look at um uh, they are current uh, uh, developer capabilities as well as um, uh, what kind of uh, uh, new changes that they have to do. So they identified uh, their developers are taking a lot of time to uh, uh, create restful services uh, because they came from a traditional uh, SOAP based um, uh, service framework. So what they did uh, identifying this uh, knowledge gap as well as capability gap, they created this tool. So what this tool doing uh, based Basically, um, if you point to a visitor uh, about your SOAP service definition and then uh, you define your RESTful service definition using Swagger, uh, so once you give those two inputs, it generates the conversion from a SOAP service into a RESTful service. So complex, uh, they are like uh, it works for more than like 80% of the services they can convert, but there are edge cases that they need to put some uh, input, but 80% uh, is a big number. So uh, they manage to increase their developer productivity by building this tool. So it's a good example. And they are in the process of uh, open source this tool as well and then donate it. Uh, so the, uh, the idea here basically uh, create your own tools based on your capabilities as well as your priorities without uh, only sticking to the industry available standards and practices. Then the next thing is uh, like you need to have proper awareness of your digital platform. We talk about uh, analytics a lot. And in addition to analytics, this concept of a store basically, a API store and app store is really uh, useful, useful to build the awareness. In a traditional organization, a person who got the URL only will have access to that particular application and his friends and so on and so forth. The store taking it to the next level uh, so this is an example of um, a couple of stores that we have and one store is our internal app store that we use a lot of apps uh, internally. So we, that is the place that we go find the applications and utilize it. And then the analytics basically um, provide a lot of uh, transparency as well, how the services, APIs, uh, so and so forth, uh, are utilized. Uh, so one of uh, our customers who's based in um, uh, uh, Minnesota, sorry, uh, in Detroit. Uh, so they actually, when I walked to their, uh, the development area, they had a lot of big screens uh, with this analytics uh, uh, running because they want to show the business, okay, business will see all the web pages and then the uh, uh, mobile apps, but behind the scene, uh, how, what is the service consumption and how many services invoke, so and so forth. So that kind of changed their culture as well as build a lot of transparency into the backend teams uh, who's involved in this project. So that's a really good way to um, improve transparency internally. Then the enablers uh, uh, for the uh, uh, this iterative process APIs because uh, when you have the APIs you can have a proper iterative approach and then build this uh, product uh, uh, frequently. And then the open interoperability is basically how these things seamlessly connect with each other. Even that segmented architecture diagram that I um, explained uh, 
things need to be connected and then there should be standard interfaces uh, based on different type of wire protocols and uh, message formats and so forth. So you have to define it as a uh, enterprise architecture practice. Then the decentralized approach because we traditionally we are more into decentralized approach. Everything runs centrally. But uh, with uh, the uh, examples that I explained, uh, you can run uh, in a decentralized manner and then even duplicate the platform in many places in your uh, infrastructure. Then use the egg technologies. Uh, some of the stuff I listed, I will go in detail, uh, like containers, microservices. Uh, those are really um, helpful. I'm not telling it's a must to be, must to run inside containers and then it's a must to use microservices, but uh, those helps to be uh, proper, uh, those, those are helping uh, to be proper iterative as well as um, to make the uh, projects uh, uh, easily running in an iterative manner. So the, uh, the microservices basically how it helps uh, with this um, single scope, you can have proper polyular um, architecture for the uh, development teams because they will build a single scope and then uh, the microservices are independent so e each and every microservice stack can have its own own uh, iteration and then it's supporting the segment architecture and then you can rapidly improve this stuff uh, one thing is uh, people are talking about microservices but people are not talking much about microservices architecture microservice architecture uh, for me microservices is a small component of the microservice architecture as architect what we should understand is the microservice architecture. So that's where the integration microservices will come into the picture, uh, the, the discovery surveillance type of things come into the picture, and then uh, the APIs, and then service routing type of things come into the picture. So that's where I think uh, we need to uh, bring uh, microservice architecture into the picture, not only thinking about just writing set of uh, microservices. Then the containers. Uh, uh, we can utilize containers a lot because the beauty of the containers, you can spin up an environment quickly and then you can destroy your environment quickly as well. So that's the uh, beauty of containers. Uh, so the, um, uh, the, uh, the container nativeness basically, it's not just running something inside the container. It's basically how you can be container native. So this is actually Sanjeeva came up with this uh, container native um, idea. So what we are looking at at container native, it has to have a rapid start, like one to two seconds, because you can't like uh, uh, wait more than that. Because the idea here, most of the stuff, stuff are immutable. Uh, so you will not deploy anything in a, in a proper container and microservices um, uh, uh, environment the hot deployment, hot update type of things are not exist. If you need to update, what you will do, you will create a new um, uh, container and then spin up and then shut down the previous one. To do that, you should have a, a startup right time of one to two seconds. And then uh, these uh, things like garbage collection, collection long running, and then um, uh, type of concepts are not available. You use and kill, that's what happens. And then uh, the request dispatching is not um, recommended that uh, they, everything uh, will process within that particular container and then response back. And there will be a central um, kind of a routing engine that will dispatch uh, the request among the containers. Because if there's a uh, tight coupling happens, the container system doesn't work because uh, the container orchestration should be able, orchestration sy system should be able to handle these request dispatching as well. Uh, so um, using the container nativeness will help you to be proper uh, iterative as well. Then the open source, I think uh, there was a question came as well um, in the morning. Uh, so the first and the most uh, um, uh, uh, important advantage with open source is prototyping because if you are going with a proprietary product you, uh, pro product, you have to wait, right, to purchase this and then start experimenting with that. And most of the, uh, the free available um, versions are not providing the fully functionality. So the main advantage is like uh, that you can quickly pick it and then start working on your project. Then the second thing is there's a freedom. That's what the developers are looking at. You can dig into the code and then look at it, so on and so forth. And the third thing is the ownership because once you engage with the open source project, you own it and then you are part of that 
particular community. And the last thing is uh, the investment against the CapEx versus uh, um, uh, the, uh, the CapEx and OpEx, basically. So it become more uh, operational expense. So you will uh, gain a lot uh, with that as well. So open source enable iterative architecture in a very um, high manner. And then this is basically the planning of iterations. As an architect, you have to uh, be very careful because this example, like if you want to uh, jump a 20 foot, you can't take 10 foot uh, two steps, right? Uh, so that's where like you need to be very careful um, and have a proper alignment with the business as well and explain the business. The first iteration or the, your MVP will address these kind of uh, 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 needs of your consumer, whether it's aligned with the business. So that's a really uh, uh, good way to look at it because traditionally uh, there was a misalignment with the business and uh, the, uh, uh, the technical parts, but with this digital uh, approach, you can't have it. The business uh, stakeholders are very important. So when you are planning your iterations, look at the business side as well as look at the uh, technology side as well. As an example, you might have initiative to use a NoSQL database, but it might not come on time, as well as your staff might be not able to handle a NoSQL data store because traditional DBS can't handle that. So if there's a technical limitation, again, scope your project. Uh, you can live without a NoSQL data store. So uh, uh, plan it accordingly. So that's uh, another advice that uh, I would like to give. Then the innovation, basically, now the iteration, uh, uh, you can iteratively improve, but there's a problem with that as well. I think Sanjeev will briefly explain. Uh, so this is what happened, right? Because they iteratively improve, but then again, they didn't know what really happened at the end. So this is one example, and then we have many examples like that. So the, uh, the idea here, you have to iteratively improve, but at some point, you have to jump to the next curve. So that's, that's how it happens in any industry. So identifying that um, uh, thing, uh, or the what's the next curve, it's uh, totally depend on how um, your business runs, your domain, and then how your uh, consumer behaviors as well. So we, I think, uh, did this thing a couple of times in 2009. We did the first jump by creating uh, this thing called Carbon. And then uh, this year, uh, 2017, February 14th, we did the next jump by releasing Ballerina because we thought that's the next curve because uh, uh, based on Sanjeeva, like uh, the service is basically about integration because you need to uh, integrate a lot. So we thought uh, there's nothing exists to do that level of uh, microservice integrations. So that's where the Ballerina come into the picture. So as a technology provider, we have done it. So I think you have to look at it from your business domain as well. Otherwise, you will fail. The iterations are good, but you need to identify where you should um, jump to the next curve. So the, the uh, product stack, uh, we didn't talk much about uh, what we provide. I think Sanjeeva uh, will give you um, uh, uh, some insight into that. So what we position basically, that's where like as a digital transformation company, uh, digital transformation technology provider, what we provide basically is iterative, innovative, and agile technology. As it's not only about the technology, like especially um, uh, my team, we closely work with the customers and then try to understand where they are and then uh, try to use what exists in their uh, infrastructures and and then build a plan with uh, the uh, uh, the customer on what's their digital journey and then what are the priorities so and so forth. So that's where like we come uh, as a uh, trusted advisor for the customers and then help them uh, in their digital journey. Uh, so that's it.